All right, welcome everybody. And uh, yeah, we're back and we're um, here for the second presentation of three parts that I was going to do. This is Spiritualism Part 2. And I titled this one, Hath God Said? And there's a reason that I've given it this title. Because I, I really believe that the devil wants to shroud the Word of God in a lot of mystery. And um, sometimes he wants to make it mean the opposite of what it means. And that's what spiritualism is. That's what the devil's trying to do. So before we start, I'm just going to lead out in a prayer. And we're going to ask our Father to give us the words here that I can speak. <clears throat> Our most holy and loving and heavenly Father, we just thank you, Father, for the time that we get to come together here tonight. And Father, to just be blessed and to truly hear your word, Father. We pray that as uh, we go through this study that the devil's snares will be unmasked and that we will see him for what he is, that he is a withering branch that's cut off, Father. We pray, Father, that we would realize that you are merciful and loving. We pray, Father, that we'd see more of your love and your character. We pray, Father, that we would truly see what was given on the cross for us, the price that was paid, that it, it is an immense price that you've had to pay in giving your only begotten Son for us. And so, Father, as we go through this study, we just pray, Father, all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so I would just say, Father, give me the words to speak and to speak the truth in love. Um, there are a lot of deceptions that the the devil's laid out for us and you know I am gonna quote from a few people I'm gonna show a few videos from people and I have nothing against these people I'm all for these people I, I know that Jesus paid the price for them and I just pray that we all realize this as we go through these things that there there is a the devil's trying to keep us all in bondage he's trying to do this to all of us and a lot of us have been in the same place and so as we go through these things we need to consider ourselves because we've been there we've been through these things, all right? So we're going to start with a few verses in the Bible, and um, this is the plain statement, the plain statement, and that's what the devil's at war with here. But in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it says, the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And that was the death penalty. And there was a death penalty right from the beginning for breaking God's law. Now in Genesis chapter 3, 1 and 2, we see this serpent come along. It says, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the, every tree of the garden. So what's the first thing that the devil says? He's got a question here. He's asking, did God's word really say that? Has God really said that? And that's what he's trying to do with the word of God. He's trying to make us question this book here. He wants us to question this book. And he does this to us in many, many ways. Now remember this old serpent. It says in Revelation 12, 9, that the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. We've all been deceived. We've all been in situations where we've been deceived. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And they're making war. And there is a war, as Brother Lem was bringing out, and there's a war. We need to go in this spiritual battle and we need to have no fear. We need to be able to willing to really overcome the deceptions that the devil's bringing. I brought some of this out in the last message, but Isaiah 8, 19 and 20, it says, When they shall say to you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek to their God for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So it might look really good to the eyes, but if it doesn't speak according to this word, it's, it's not from God. And so what does the devil come to Eve and what does he say? He says, ye shall not surely die. In other words, God's word is a lie, Right? This death decree is not true. And who's saying this? It's Satan and his angels. They do this a lot. Now, this is from Ellen White here, and it says, The declaration of the serpent to Eve in Eden, ye shall not surely die, was the first sermon ever preached upon the immortality of the soul. Immortality of the soul. You're going to live forever. You can't die. Yet this declaration, resting solely upon the authority of Satan, is echoed from the pulpits of Christendom 
and is received by the majority of mankind as readily as it was received by our first parents. The divine sentence is, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, Ezekiel 18.20. So again, changing the judgment. This is where this all starts. It was started way back in heaven when Satan attacked God's character and he came to him saying, it's wrong to have a death decree in the law. What kind of God is this that would have a death decree or a penalty for sin? He changed the statement to the opposite by adding one word, ye shall not surely die. I want to show a few videos here of some of these people and what they're doing, how they're uh, allowing other spirits, but what this is all about. And does everybody remember what the one body that, Christ, or that the devil really wants to gather people into, what it was called, the one body of Satan? Remember, it was one body. It was called spiritualism. The one-woman entertainment empire known as Oprah has strong affiliations with the demonic realm. The most familiar face on television says, You can not only use your body and physical self. This is how I see acting. I ask my body to be the carrier for the spirits of those who have come before me in a way that is most meaningful to the character. Just become the vehicle for that character. Calling out for these entities to take her over so that she may become a sparkling puppet, Oprah admits of her work before the camera. I tried to empty myself and let the spirit inhabit me. With her global influence, her shows have become a smorgasbord for the New Age agenda. So what's coming in there? What's, what are they allowing? They're consulting with familiar or dead spirits, spirits that they think they know. And this is the same thing with a lot of these actors, actresses. And this is something that we got to remember if we're ever... Leonardo DiCaprio believes himself to be a vessel put on earth for acting. Vessels are meant to be filled and DiCaprio has opened himself up to evil spirits for this purpose. As Agnieszka Holland, DiCaprio's director in Total Eclipse explains it, Leo's like a medium. He opens his body and his mind to receive messages coming from another person's life. He's the new Leonardo DiCaprio. There's nobody like him and he's like nobody. Um, he's so special. He's a chameleon. He can do anything. It's, it's shocking. I mean, he was just born to be an actor. It's the same way with Meryl. You see this and you just, you're dazzled by their talent. DiCap and let's look at a couple more here. I just, the idea is, I just want to show you guys that in this the television, which I'm sure I'm hoping that we don't watch none of these shows that these movie actors are in, they're basically demons entertaining. They're entertaining the people. And so ultimately we need to we need to turn that TV off if we don't if we don't already. Oscar award winning actor Denzel Washington told 60 Minutes exactly how he brings forth his best performances. Basically what I did was got on my knees and sort of communicated with the spirits and when i came out i was in charge powerful scene powerful scene it, it was i couldn't have acted that i couldn't have written that down and made a decision to play that the performance by denzel i'm gonna fast forward it a bit I, there's a lot of time but basically the malcolm x where he, he's malcolm x he said he allowed malcolm x to come into him a dead spirit right now there is some good shows on TV, right? Like Little House in the Prairie and Highway to Heaven that we can get our children to watch. No? Okay, yeah. Let's just look at this video quickly just so we, uh, we understand here. Another celebrity many will be shocked to discover communicated with demonic spirits and even received movie scripts from them was Michael Landon. Of his dead father, Michael Landon stated, I felt my father's presence with me, enlightening my memories. I really heard my father speaking to me from another dimension, filling my mind with just the right words. The story came so fast and was so right. In three days, the script was complete. While it is true that Michael Landon did present Christian principles in his shows, shows like Highway to Heaven presented a touchy-feely New Age God that anyone could have a relationship with without knowing Christ like the scriptures clearly state. Jesus made it clear when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. All right. So again, these are some of the things that are going on. People want to share these things with their kids because they're trying to find something that's good on TV maybe that would help them. I'm going to get into a little bit more about the kids, but this is uh, from Acts of the Apostles, page 289. It says, It is fondly supposed that heathen superstitions have disappeared before the civilization of the 20th century, but the Word of God and the stern testimony of facts declare that sorcery is practiced in this age as verily as in the days of the old-time magicians. The ancient system of magic is in reality the same as what it is now known as modern spiritualism. 
Satan is finding access to thousands of minds by presenting himself under the guise of departed friends. Satan implies this device in order to gain control of minds. And so how's he gaining control of minds? Through the and how about through the television? Right? Because he's using these people to gain control of minds. Remember, there's a threefold union, and it has to do with the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon, which is the papacy, apostate Protestantism, and worldlings. We read about this already, and we read this in the last message that I presented. And so how does the dragon go to all the world? He goes through the kings of the earth. He's got to get control of the media, and then the media to the mind. And that's why people act the way they do. What you behold is what you become changed into. By beholding, you become changed in the same image. So how about we watch an innocent little sorcerer like this? Is this good for our kids? Mickey Mouse? Right. All the Disney flicks and all that stuff, they're all meant to aim at the little children. But ultimately, they're sorcerer. I just wanted to show you one of the Disney magicians, David Copperfield. He came through Disney. This the right video. Satanist Anton LaVey, who founded the Church of Satan and authored the Satanic Bible, knows for a fact that Hollywood is subversively indoctrinating our society into the teachings of Satanism. LaVey states, Many of you have already read my writings identifying TV as the new God. There's a little thing I neglected to mention up until now. Television is the major mainstream infiltration for the new Satanic religion. All right, All right so... That's speaking about Anton LaVey, leader of the Church of Satan. They're saying this is how they reach the world. That's their religion through the television. Now, here's uh, Shirley MacLaine. Shirley MacLaine's 40 plus films have escalated her to superstar status, and she has used this popularity to further her cause as a prominent player to advance the New Age movement. If you're somebody like me, and there's millions of us out there millions. who are interested in astrology, meditation, numerology, it should be no surprise to learn that she too undergoes possession that results in successful performances. McLean explains. I had seen so many channels and mediums over the past few years. I decided I would apply the same thing to show business. I simply channeled the character that we had created. This time I allowed the character to inhabit me. I trusted that the magic would work. Channeling and inspiration had become one and the same. Mm. She's loving it. And then we launched into the first take and two voices came out of you. Do you remember this? Two voices, and they were, they were simultaneous words, but they were two levels of sound. And I looked over at you, you were amazed, I was amazed, and you said, well, sure, sure, oh, I'm, I'm many different people. <laughs> I said, no, Jack, you're channeling. You're channeling. And they're all laughing like it's normal, right? Because a lot of these people know about what's going on. Now, here's... Just a clip of David Copperfield. I had, thought I had another one, but it's about the supposed channeling. spirits of the dead that you're talking with are demon spirits, your fallen angels. Oh, one of my all-time heroes is Orson Welles. Read these words after me. I despair of my sins. I despair of my sins. Oh God of all goodness, how oh God, could I ever have offended thee? Of all goodness. <laughs> Not many people know this, but Orson was a terrific magician. And the day after he died, I got a letter in the mail. It was from Orson. Well, David, I finally made it to the hereafter. I'd love to do some magic with you when you have the time. Give me a call. I'm staying at Shirley MacLaine's place. Here's looking down at you, your friend, Orson. Well, tonight, I thought I'd place that call. Any clearer now? Ladies and gentlemen, not an imposter. The real Orson Welles. Oh, Dave, I'm in a terrible mess. I'm directing a picture and I've, oh, I've got 90 million things to take care of. I've really got my hands full. So Orson Welles, who's dead, is speaking to David Copperfield here. He's channeling spirits. Now, ultimately, what are these spirits that they are channeling? They're demons, right? They're demons. Revelation 16, 14 tells us they are the spirits of devils. They work miracles. They go to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So what are they making war with? God's people, right. There, there's a war going on. There's a battle. 
Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, says, Spiritualism is now changing its form, veiling some of its more objectionable and immoral features and assuming a Christian guise. Formerly, it denounced Christ and the Bible. Now it professes to accept both. The Bible is interpreted in a manner that is attractive to the unrenewed heart. While solemn and vital truths are made of no effect, a God of love is presented. But his justice, his denunciations of sin, the requirements of his holy law are kept out of sight. Pleasing, bewitching fables captivate the senses of those who do not make God's word the foundation of their faith. Christ is as verily rejected as before, but Satan has so blinded the eyes of the people that the deception is not discerned. The Bible talks about blinding the eyes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, they're blinded when reading the Law of Moses, but what are they blinded to when they read the Law of Moses? What's something that they really they can't they don't want to see is kept out of sight? What's the things that are kept out of sight, it says here? His justice, right, and the requirements of the law, his denunciations of sin. Now, this is from the National Spiritualistic Association of Churches, and there's a lot of spiritualists out there right now, but this is a couple of their beliefs. Number four and five, it says, We affirm that the existence and personal identity of the individual continue after the change called death. In other words, they don't die. Thou shalt not surely die. We affirm that communication with the so-called dead is a fact, scientifically proven by the phenomena of spiritualism. So ultimately, when you see all these, all these actors and stuff, what are they deceived into? It's spiritualism. It's one body. It's the body of spiritualism. And it's all based on this one lie. Ye shall not surely die. In other words, they're talking to the spirits of dead people right now, right? So who... Would God destroy? Is this contrary to his character? This was at the time of the flood. And I want you guys to see something about this. This is uh, this you shall not surely die doctrine right from the beginning. It says, as sin became more general, it appeared less and less sinful. And they finally declared that the divine law was no longer in force, that it was contrary to the character of God to punish transgression. Has anybody ever heard of anything like that? Okay. They denied that his judgments were to be visited upon the earth. Satan, when tempting Eve to disobey God, said to her, Ye shall not surely die. Do you see a connection here between those two doctrines? Great men, worldly honored and wise men, repeated the same. The threatenings of God, they said, are for the purpose of intimidating and will never be verified. You need not be alarmed. Such an event as the destruction of the world by the God who made it and the punishment of the beings he has created will never take place. So would God destroy? What were they saying? God won't do it, right? God surely won't do it. Ye shall surely die, ye shall not surely die. They're changing the judgment. I will destroy them. Genesis 6, 13, 6, 17, 6, verse 7. All these verses tell us that God would do it, right? But what does Satan say? Such an event as the destruction of the world by the God who made it and the punishment of the beings he was created will never take place. It's the same thing. Ye shall surely die, Ye shall not surely die. God, Satan. And the question is, do we believe the word of God? That's what we have to, we're coming down to here. He's a, making a war, an attack on the word of God. Here's another quote from their Declaration of Principles from the National Spiritual Asso- Spiritualist Association of Churches. They say, through mediumship, communication with mortals who have experienced transition from earth has been established, just thus proving there is no death. Thou shall not surely die. Now remember, great controversy of 588 and 89. I, this is the quote I was talking about. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. Church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them, and Satan determines to unite them in one body, the body of Satan, right? The church of Satan. And thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. So what is his body? What's his church? It's spiritualism. And it might be papists, it includes Protestants, it includes worldlings, it includes everybody. They're, he's sweeping them all into the same. That's why Anton LaVey says the real Satanist is not so easily recognized as such. They might be standing in the, sitting in the pew, standing in the pulpit maybe. So there's a war, again, Great Controversy 556. We don't need to be deceived. None need be deceived by the lying claims of spiritualism. God has given the world sufficient light to enable them to discover the snare. So we don't need to be deceived by this. It's already shown 
The theory which forms the very foundation of spiritualism is at war with the plainest statements of Scripture. So it's like this. Thou shall surely die. Thou shall not surely die. The plain statement. What's the plain statement? I will destroy the earth with a flood. Satan comes along and says, no, he'll never destroy the earth with a flood. It can't be. It's contrary to the character of God. Has God said? That's the real question right there that you have to ask yourself because how many verses in the Bible do you have to get rid of in order to believe this, that God won't destroy the earth, right? There's a lot. One person told me that they would have to get rid of a third of the Bible. That's a lot of the Bible. That's a lot of the Bible. Has anybody ever heard of the book, The Shack? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. The Shack is a novel by Canadian author William Young. It was the number one paperback trade fiction seller on the New York Times bestseller list from June 2008 to early 2010. So that's a pretty popular book, right? The Shack is the first title to dominate USA Today's bestseller list in 2017. That's this year. The Shack by William P. Young, propelled by a movie adaptation. It had run for four consecutive weeks at the top in March. Now, there's a lot of strange teachings in this booklet here. And um, I could mention a few, like a God that's a female and other stuff like this, but this is still going through the churches. It's still going through the churches. Now, here is an interview with Paul Young, the writer of the book. It says, do you agree that the cross is a place of punishment for our sin? He says, no, I am not a penal substitution reformation. I don't see that it's necessary to have the Father punish in that sense the Son. Did the Son take our punishment for us? He did, right? He was our substitution. Does he believe that? Now, Great Controversy 537 tells us something. It says, a large class to whom the doctrine of eternal torment is revolting are driven to the opposite error. This happens a lot, okay? And we want to look at what the opposite error is because we don't want to be on one side of the ditch and go to the other side of the ditch. We want to be in the middle of the road and we want to be on the truth, right? So they see that the scriptures represent God as being a God of love. Definitely we believe that. And compassion. And they cannot believe that he will consign his creatures to the fires of an eternally burning hell. But holding that the soul is naturally immortal, they see no alternative but to conclude that all mankind will finally be saved. Many regard the threatenings of the Bible as designed merely to frighten men into obedience and not to be literally fulfilled. Will his judgments be literally fulfilled? Do you guys believe this? I hope so. The Bible says it. We need to believe the word, right? Such a doctrine, presuming upon God's mercy but ignoring his justice, pleases the carnal heart and emboldens the wicked in their iniquity. So we need to be careful because what's this going to lead people into? Is it going to help them and strengthen them in spiritual life or is it going to lead them the wrong way? See, the fruit could look really good to the eyes. It might look like it's super nice. This God's really nice. He's loving. He's more loving. than. But it, in reality, the fruit is deadly. Now, just a quick video here. This is Paul Young again. God has never wanted sacrifice. Never. That's never, that's never been a part of God's plan. Right? Has it ever been a part of God's plan to save the world? It was a part of God's plan from the beginning. The two covenanted together. It didn't just come in later on. It was a part of God's plan from the beginning. If sin should ever enter, there was a substitution for us for salvation. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says, Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his own wounds we are healed. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. There was a time it was definitely part of the plan to save us. Now this is from the movie The Shack, or the book, actually. You can find this on pages 120 and 21. It says, What about your wrath? Aren't you the one spilling out great bowls of wrath and throwing people into a burning lake of fire? Now, there's your one extreme, remember? Great controversy. So here we go, and it says, Papa, which is a woman, the God in this movie. But it says, I am not who you think I am, Mackenzie. I don't need to punish people for sin. Sin is its own punishment devouring from the inside. It is not my purpose to punish. It is my joy to cure it. So in other words, there's no punishment for sin. And he says, I don't need to punish people. 
There's no punishment. But what does the Bible say? Isaiah 13, 11, and this is what we need to speak according to. Remember, these spirits don't speak according to this word, right? Spiritualism. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their iniquity. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Isaiah 26, 21. I'll punish you according to the fruit of your deeds, declares Jehovah. Is it wrong for the Lord to punish? Well, let's look. Because some people, I believe, are saying that it's wrong, and that's why they don't want to believe in a God like this. They're coming against God, as we're going to see here. Now, it says, to sustain his charge of God's injustice. Remember, this is all about God's injustice. God is unjust because he put a penalty in his law toward him. He resorted to misrepresentation of the words and acts of the Creator. And that's what the devil's doing. It was his policy to perplex the angels with subtle arguments concerning the purposes of God. Everything that was simple, he shrouded in mystery and by artful perversion cast doubt upon the plainest statements of Jehovah. Now, as we read some of these texts, they seem pretty simple, right? God will do it. We need to believe it. But what is the devil trying to do with these texts? He shrouds them in mystery, twists them around, and then casts doubt upon the plainest statements in the Word of God. And by the time you're looking at the Word of God, you're like, you know what, I can't really believe this anymore. This is plain, but it doesn't really mean what it says it does. Has God really said this? We can't trust the Word of God. That's where it leads to. It's from Adventist Today. This is an article, um, and we're getting a little closer to home now. John McClarty, and uh, some of you might know him. He's a pastor or minister up in Washington. He has an article in Adventist Today called My People, and he talks about this including homosexuals and stuff like that as being part of the body of Christ. And um, this is just a video, and Stephen Iyer... He's the uh, director of the movie called Seventh Gay Adventist. And he was interviewed by John McClarty here. John McClarty is the guy on the right that wrote the article. And this is just before a sermon called, um, I believe it's Their People Too or something like that. For me growing up, I didn't even realize you could be gay. In right, yeah. Honestly, I just didn't even think like that was even possible. In fact, I didn't even realize there were gay Adventists when I was in high school. Turns out I have two close friends that were gay that I just didn't know about. I need to be patient with those other people that are maybe just now getting to know gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender and queer Adventists for the first time. Being gay and Adventist is an identity. And you, can't, you don't rip that don't out of somebody. Take that away it's from it's who that person is. And different interpretations of scripture. Different interpretations of scripture. Isn't that what that quote we just read said? He's uh, reinterpreting the scripture, shrouding the plainest statements in, in prophecy. Now, here's one from last week. This is Andy McDonald. It, it isn't our LGBTQ friends that are embarrassing. What is shameful is that we have to ask if they would be welcomed or what our stand is on acceptance of LGBTQ people. There are, depending on your view of scripture, five or six references in all of scripture about homosexuality that address that topic. Two or three, depending on your view, two or three in the Old Testament, three in the New Testament. We could and you should read and study and pray over these texts. I don't mean to be disrespectful or dismissive of Scripture, but I don't really care what it says about my gay brother or my lesbian sister. I don't mean to be disrespectful or dismissive of scripture, but I don't really care what it says about my gay brother or my lesbian sister, except that God calls you and God calls me not to judge, but to love. Okay. These are some of the things that are going on. And here's another one here, David Larson. He says, and this is the professor in ethics studies. He says, the six texts that are usually, usually used to clobber, to condemn people who practice the LGBT lifestyle should be removed from the Bible. Then let us just love everyone. That's in Adventist today. And so this is what's going on here is that, as you can see, this is spiritualism, right? Had God really said, did God really say this in the Bible about homosexuality? And it's not to clobber the homosexuals or nothing like that, but we do need to call them to repentance. And it's not an attack on these ministers. If I put these in, in the thing, we need to call them to repentance. Is that clear with everybody? I hope it is. <clears throat> 
Genesis 19, 24, the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone fire from, heaven, from the Lord out of heaven. Who did that? It was Jehovah, right? It was the Lord. And he said he did it. Do we believe that he did it? Do we believe the plain statement in the word of God? Hath God really said? We got to believe the word of God for what it says. We can't just twist it to mean what we want it to say. Now here again is Pastor John McClarty, and I just want you to listen to what he says about the judgment. A year or so ago, I was leading the Bible study, and we were in 1 Samuel, I think. And we came to some passages, and Linda Hybe would read this passage of Scripture, and she would rear back and go, it would be, you know, God said, go kill somebody or something. I mean, it, you know, God said, and Linda would go, that's not right. Is it, is God Linda doing was right. injustice? If we are going to be faithful to God, there are times when we must push back against the ancient words. And I chose this morning's scripture to be the most, well, to be at least a dramatic statement in scripture that if you found yourself going, yes, amen, you are sick. If you say amen to certain statements. What do you do with that text? It is in scripture. It is part of our history as people of faith, and we are repulsed by it. And we should be. Should we be repulsed by the scriptures, or is it possible that our brother John McClarty is having a misunderstanding of the scriptures and he doesn't understand justice? And he doesn't understand true and righteous are his judgments. Maybe he thinks something that God is evil or something like that. And you know, when you start to do that, aren't you asking the very same questions, have God said, and then you have to twist the word all the way around to mean what you want it to mean? And you have to bend it, do a, some spiritual gymnastics to make it really mean what you want. Now, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, 39, I kill and I make alive. And the context of this is talking about how he brought them out of Egypt. He definitely does, and he said he does. Now, what, this is a quote from Ellen White just below it, and I know people have spiritualized this ch text away too, I kill. But you read the context, it's talking about his vengeance. And it's talking about things that he did to bring them out of Egypt and, and nations that he had destroyed. But it says, how carefully God protects the rights of men. Does that sound like your God and my God? He has attached a penalty to willful murder. We know there's a penalty, right? Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed. Genesis 9, 6. If one murderer were permitted to go unpunished, he would, by this evil influence, what would it be to let the, let the murderer be unpunished? It'd be evil. By this evil influence and cruel violence subvert others. This would result in a condition of things similar to that which existed before the flood. God must punish murderers. He gives life and he will take life. He kills and he makes alive. He will take the life of a murderer. If that life becomes a terror and a menace, mercy shown to a willful murderer is cruelty to his fellow men. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Numbers 35, 16. Who put that in the law? It's the father. It's the father. I'm going to get to something here as we continue. To our merciful God, the act of punishment is a strange act. While he does not delight in vengeance, he will execute judgment upon the transgressor of his law. He is forced to do this to preserve the inhabitants of the earth from utter depravity and ruin. In order to save some, he must cut off those who have become hardened in sin. So sometimes there's, it's salvation to cut off the person that might be a willful murderer. What would the willful murderer do to the rest of the group if he didn't cut him off? He could kill the rest of the group, right? So we know that God's judgments are always righteous. We know that he knows the right time, and when he commands something, he's not unrighteous. Now let's look at a, a story here on, in the book of Samuel, because that was who John McClarty was referring to in the book of Samuel. It says, Samuel said to the Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, hearken thou to the voice of whose words? The word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, 
Spare them not, but slay both man, women, and infant, and suckling, and ox, and sheep, and camel, and ass. Now, before we look at this, if we looked at this with a worldly perspective, we might see this as something evil. If we don't understand all the circumstances, sometimes it can come off and say, wow, what kind of... But if we have that thought, guess where that thought's coming from? It's not from God, right? It's not from God. Let's look at a quote from Spirit of Prophecy, First Spirit of Prophecy 328. It says, The Lord is regarded as cruel by many in requiring his people to make war with other nations. They say that it is contrary to his benevolent character. That's going around, right? Man has no right to say to his maker, why doest thou this? Why doest thou this? Where's that question from? That's how God said, really? Why would God say that, right? It's a question. But it says here, there is no injustice in his character. God is born with them until they filled up the measure of their iniquity. And then he has brought upon them swift destruction. He has used his people as instruments of his wrath to punish wicked nations. Now, would God ever command his kids to do something that he wouldn't do? So he's not just saying, okay, you go be wicked because I know it's on your wicked heart. Because some people are saying that. They're teaching that because their hearts are wicked, that's what made them go and do this wicked stuff that God said, to go do what's on your wicked heart. That doesn't sound right. If my kid is doing something wicked, I tell him, you know, you need to change. I wouldn't tell him to go do something wicked. Patriarchs and Prophets 627, Saul had failed to bear the test of faith in, trying, in the trying situation at Gilgal. The Lord would grant him another opportunity to learn the lesson of unquestioning faith in his word and obedience to his commands. So should Saul have questioned this command here from the Lord? It was an unquestionable command. It wasn't like, okay, do what Moses did. This was not a situation like where Moses questioned God, right? This is an unquestioning command. 1 Samuel 15, 13, what happened in this story? Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou, O Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But what was wrong here? What did he not do? He didn't obey, he didn't destroy the king, and he brought back all of the sheep and oxen and everything like that to sacrifice. And in verse 22, it said, Samuel said, Had the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. So this was a commandment that was to be obeyed. And what happened after this? Did the voice of the Lord keep coming to Saul after this? No, he ended up having to go somewhere else to try to hear the voice of the Lord, didn't he? It says in verse 23, For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as the iniquity of idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. So obviously the Lord's not commanding him to do something wicked. This was wickedness not to do it because it brought more problems, right? 1 Samuel 28, what happened to Saul? It says, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not. No voice, no more. See, this is what's happening here. This is what the devil wants. He doesn't want us to hear this voice anymore. He wants us to start to question it to the point where we're, it's so mixed up that we can't even trust it. That's what he wants us to be. He said, he neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servant, seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there's a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. So when Pastor John McClarty is saying, that's just wrong, what spirit is he having? What spirit is it? It's Satan's, and it's following in the devil's way. If you say that this is wrong and that God is wrong, this is leading you to corrupt your wisdom in the same way that Satan corrupted his wisdom when he thought that, God was evil, and he went around to a third of the angels and said, hey, oh, wow, God has a death penalty in law. This is really not nice. Like, God is wrong, and he started to misrepresent the character of God by misrepresenting his law. It's an attack on his law. It's an attack on his judgments. And that's what this God doesn't kill doctrine is. Let's keep reading here, 28, 11. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring unto thee? And he said, bring me Samuel. But remember, the dead know not anything. So, Saul, Saul did not trust the word of the Lord that the dead know not anything. Saul was led away from the word of the Lord. Remember, seek not the familiar spirits. They speak not according to this word. Now the demon's message to Saul, although it was a denunciation of sin and a prophecy of retribution, was not meant to reform but to goad him to despair and ruin. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to die, but it was only meant to destroy him, right? 
It says, The teachings of the demon gods in ancient times fostered the vilest license. Spiritualism declares that there is no death, no sin, no judgment, no retribution, that men are unfallen demigods, that desire is the highest law, and that man is accountable only to himself. Does not such teaching suggest an origin to that of demon worship? Now, the law demands death. Ellen White says this, It was not enough that Jesus should die in order to meet the demands of the broken law, but he died a shameful death. Does everybody understand that the law will demand death at the end of the world? This is true, right? And who put this in, in the law? A.T. Jones writes it thus, he says, Let us see the letter of righteousness, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, demands the death penalty for every violation of it. This is the penalty which God himself fixed, and it can no more be separated from his law than God himself can be. It's God himself who put this demand of death in the law. Now, I've got a video here, and I just want to say something before I go through a few of these because I have a deep care for these brethren that are over here. And I've been, I've traveled with this brother here and I really, the message is spreading very fast. And you know, if I don't show these things, the people are not going to be aware. And I'm really concerned. You know, when Ellen White brought out John Harvey Kellogg, she said, I knew that I must warn the brethren, right? There's a watchman on the wall and that's what God wants us all to be. He wants us to give a warning, sound the trumpet. And you know, I really pray for these brethren. I pray that God brings their heart into unity with his word again. And I'm only bringing this out to show that God really is a God of love and that where this teaching can lead, even though the fruit looks really good to the eyes, it's not from God. Let's just look at these videos here and we'll see. Remember, the law demands death. Who then instituted the penalty for sin? If uh, we understand, or most people understand, that it is God who instituted this, that within the law itself, the law itself demands death. The problem with this understanding, if the law itself is the demander of death, then why on earth within this same law does it say, thou shalt not kill? This is complete hypocrisy within the law itself. It represents schizophrenia on behalf of its author. If the law itself is demanding these things in and of itself, and then it says, do not kill, it condemns itself. It's self-destructive in nature. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Um, does, that, does everybody understand what he just said there? If the law itself demands death, this would make God, this means God is schizophrenic and he's a complete hypocrite. It's putting us in a mindset where we're going to hate God, isn't it? Right, because we know it's the law that demands death, right? I just want to play this one here as well. Yeah, there's a difference between murder and judgment. That's right. Not all killing is murder. Sometimes God authorizes killing. He commands it, and it's not murder. It's not always murder. It's justice. And we need to understand this. This is our Father's character that's on the tack here. If it is God himself who will execute the sinner. If it is God himself who will punish the transgressor of his law for sin, then the offering of his son to, to save those from their transgressions is really quite a sick joke. You are offering to save us from your own system. You created the system of penalties. You created the system of punishment for transgression. You instituted the idea of death for those who would transgress your law. And then you offer us your son. What kind of schizophrenia is this? And yet, this is what the world believes. God so loved the world. God so loved the world, he created a paradigm in which he himself could not escape. And in order to release himself from his own folly, he gives his son to deliver us. Folly, crazy. That's crazy. It makes no sense at all. The page? I can give it to you later. Is that okay? 
Okay. And uh, you're talking about this one, 5 Bible Commentary 1127. All right. So God punishes, is, this is what it says. If God instituted death penalty in his law, the video is saying that God is schizophrenic, he's crazy, he's a fool, he's, his, the cross is a sick joke, and he's a hypocrite. No, he's saying that if we believe that, that's what the world believes, that's what most of Christianity believes, that there's a penalty in the law. And I've got a few videos. If you guys want to see them again for clarity later, I've got, like, there's about nine of them that I've just got just short clips. If God made the death decree for sin. Then the death of Jesus on the cross really is hollow. It's an attack on the cross. If God made the death decree for sin, then the death of Jesus on the cross is hollow. And God was the one that made the death decree for sin. The Bible's very clear. We've got, we've already, we already read that from A.T. Jones, from Ellen White. And you can look up, it, look up these death decrees in the Bible. There's a lot of them. It's God who gave these. It's not God is schizophrenic or God is crazy. God is a fool. And I'm just, I'm just praying for a turn for everybody who's going down this direction. I really am. To draw back and to realize this is not schizophrenia. It's mercy and love and justice, and God does it in righteousness. Now, Numbers chapter 24, the 20, Exodus 21 and 23, there's numerous judgments. Now, who are they from? Are they from God or Satan? There's a lot of people saying they're from Satan, but Exodus 24, 3 says these are the words of the Lord. They're the judgments of the Lord, and he's the one who gives these judgments. He's righteous. Now, there's also something that I just noticed that sin was being redefined in this video. I had a few videos of this I could have shown because really, the more you see it, the more you're like, wow, it gets, it, it is really serious. Now, this is um, a new definition of sin. And I'll show you why it's a new definition in a second. Listen they rejoice carefully. in his mercy, in that he forgave them. He forgave them of their transgression. The angels. But we do not, we do not call it sin. Because sin is something else. Sin is the belief that you've gone too far and that you cannot be forgiven and you must take by force that which belongs to you. This, there's the difference. The angels who went back to God are not said to be sinners because they did not transgress the law to the point where they believed they could not return. That's what sin is. Sin is going to the point of no return yeah. and saying, I cannot be forgiven. Yeah. And, and I just want to make a point here. If I, if I killed five people and I didn't think I went to the point of no return, because that's what he's saying. It's when you think you have went to the point of no return, then you can't return, right? So it's about what you think, right? If I killed five people and I didn't think I went to the point of no return, I wouldn't be a sinner. Is that correct? Right? Yeah. You're a sinner once you sin once. And it doesn't matter if you think you went to the point of no return. It's not about what you think. It's about what does the law say. The lure by which spiritualism attracts the multitudes is its pretended power to draw aside the veil from the future. It is Satan's purpose to destroy men's confidence in the word of God. Lead them to seek a knowledge of what God has wisely veiled from them. Now this is like presented sometimes as we know more than the prophets. The prophets of old didn't really understand what they were writing back here when they wrote these judgments, and they think that we are veiled from something. That's what they're teaching in this God doesn't kill stuff. And so this is spreading, like I showed you. Like, if you go into that movement with uh, the, uh, the shack and all that, like, there's millions of people that are getting into this stuff, right? So this is hitting close to home, though. It's hitting close to home. So they come to despise what God has revealed in his holy word. You think that's coming? Right. Now, that's a secret knowledge. God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. This is Satan trying to put this in your mind like you have special knowledge. You know, you know more than the prophets. The prophets didn't really understand what they were teaching back then. And now we teach it a little better than the prophets themselves taught it. That's what it's leading to. You shall be as gods. Patriarchs and Prophets 554, it says, to persons of culture and refinement, he presents spiritualism in its more refined intellectual aspects. He enlists the affections by his eloquent portrayals of love. Now, this is what this is called. It's called a more loving God, okay? 
and charity excites the imagination to lofty heights, leading men to take so great pride in their own wisdom that in their hearts they despise the eternal one. That's what spiritualism leads us to do. It leads us to despise the eternal one. Now, if I start calling God schizophrenic, crazy, fool, sick joke, hypocrite, what is it leading me to? What is this doctrine leading me to? It's leading me to despise the eternal one. And it's our minds are being influenced by Satan. We might not realize it. We need, we need to realize it. But this is, what, this is why I brought this up because so close in our movement right now, it says as spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. So as it's getting closer to you guys and to the truth, does it have more power to deceive and ensnare? If they're keeping the feasts and other things like that, then it's more deceptive, right? Than it is if it was, you know, it probably wouldn't be as deceptive if it was the shack. We'd probably discern it a little more, you know? But let's just read this quote here. God's love is represented in our day as a being of such a character as would forbid is destroying the sinner. Men reason from their own low standard of right and justice. So what's wrong with their minds? What, what are they misunderstanding? Sure. Right and justice, right. He makes and executes his law. He does do this. Law has no penalty is of no force. Law that has no penalty. It definitely has a penalty. The plea may be made that a loving father would not see his children suffering the punishment of God by fire. And a lot of people are saying, well, it's just a spiritual fire and stuff like that. No. It, in spirit of prophecy, as the rocks are on fire, the elements are on fire. It says, while he had power to relieve them, God would, for the good of his subjects and for their safety, punish the transgressor. So why does he do this? Is it bad for their bad? Because he's evil? It's for the good of the subjects, for their safety. He can do infinite justice that man has no right to do before his fellow man. Who will say God will not do what he says he will do, right? He says he'll do it in this book. Are we sitting here asking that question? Has God said? Who will say God will not do what he said he will do? The enemy will, right? It's the enemy. Has God said? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The just shall live by faith. And we don't want to come to the point where we're questioning this to the point where we can't even see victory anymore. Because God says in the Bible, he says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But what does the minister in the pulpit teach? You know, we're all continuing in sin. We're all going to fall. We're all going to fail. What's that? Isn't that spiritualism? It's twisting the plain statement in the Word of God, right? That's exactly what. Have you guys heard of this? The art community? You know, that's Tony Palmer and all those guys with the unity. Well, this is one thing, one other thing I wanted to pick out here. The religious bodies all over Christendom will become more and more closely united in sentiment. They will make of God a peculiar something. What's that mean? Mysterious, maybe? In order to escape from loyalty to him who is pure, holy, and undefiled, and who denounces all sin as a production of the apostate. So what are they going to unite on? They're going to unite on a different God. And you know, this is a peculiar something right here. It's called the mystery of the Trinity. It's a central doctrine of the Catholic Church. This is spiritualism. Watch, I'll show you. Name, and, name on the forehead. Look at, do you notice the connection here of the Trinity to right there, the craft and all that? And that's, a, that's an Adventist book right there with the sun around it and stuff. But that's miracle of unity, the order of the ark community. They're all uniting in this, right? Now, there's a question here. Have God said if thou be the Son of God? That's a question. And James White says, the way spiritualizers have disposed of or denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ is first using the old, unscriptural Trinitarian creed. I'm going to go through this quickly, but I want to just say that this is part of it. God has promised to give the firstborn of heaven to save the sinner. This is the gospel. God so loved the world. And this is how God's love is manifest to the world through his only begotten Son. And the devil... Well, these teachers of spiritualism, it says they come in a bewitching manner to deceive you. They want to destroy your faith in Christ being the Son of God. Spiritualism denies that he's the Son of God. And this is the way that, one of the ways that he does it, through the Trinity, as James White was saying. Modern spiritualism is a revival of witchcraft and demon worship. They refuse to acknowledge Christ as the Son of God. Spiritualism denies the Father and the Son. The Bible pronounces it the manifestation of Antichrist. And as we've seen, what is the papacy teaching? Do they teach that he's the firstborn of heaven from earliest times? 
or denying he's a real son and God really had a son. What about the feast? The Bible says, there's a bunch of quotes here, but the last one down at the bottom says, let us keep the feast, right? What's the opposite of let us keep the feast? Let us not keep the feast, right? What, what word, the word of God or the word of man? See, when we change the statement here, we're spiritualizing away the plainest statements in the word of God. It's the same thing with the new moons. We're going to come together from new moon to new moon in the new heaven and earth. We could say we're not. It's the opposite. It's the devil, right? These things are what the devil's doing. He's trying to have us deny these plain truths. Now I'm going to stop right here. We're going to have a prayer, but I just want to say a couple last things. Father wants us to get into this book. He wants us to understand his book. His word is truth. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The only way you're going to be justified is to believe it and believe that it has the power to do what it says it will do. There's no other way to overcome the world. So what is Satan trying to do? He's trying to completely get you to question, has God really said? Who will say God will not do? We need to get that question out of our mind. And when we we don't understand why judgment is executed, we need to say, God knows, he understands, he sees a bigger picture here. Maybe there's something going on with this tribe over here that he's going to judge them and put and do what he said. Or maybe there's a reason why he commanded Saul to do this. Or maybe there's a reason why he commanded um, as we, Gideon, as we re- heard in the last message. There's a reason. God has reasons. And we need to accept that true and righteous are his judgments. And he's not telling his children to do something that he wouldn't do. He's telling them to do what he would do because he's a God of love and a God of mercy. And that's truly what God is. He has mercy on his people. And through these things, in order to save some, sometimes he destroys some. And it's always in love, just like he did with the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, and many other places. He's a God of love. Let's have a prayer and close in prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, We just thank you, Father, for your word, your precious promises, that by these we can become partakers of the divine nature. Father, we pray for the people that are in these videos. Father, we know that the devil is trying to come to each one of us, and he's trying to put questions like these in each of our minds. And Father, I pray that you would give us all discernment and give the people in these videos that we've talked about discernment. Help them to realize, Father, we want to welcome them into the fold. We want to see them in the kingdom of heaven. We don't want to see them outside, Father. We don't want to see them standing at the judgment as the, on the accuser's side. We want to see them standing with us, Father. So we pray for them as well. And we just thank you for your precious and holy and loving spirit. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.